Mr. Paul Longstreth. How are you, sir? Very well, uh, considering everything. Um, yes. Still breathing, still standing. <laughs> yep, absolutely. We're both vertical. That is a good sign. <laughs> right. No ventilator on either of us right? yet. <laughs> so all to the good. Uh, great to have you with us on this thing, man. I, I want to loop all the way back and, and uh, talk, start talk, talk to you about uh, your, uh, your roots. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Terrebonne Parish. My mother was born here. My father was a, a traveling preacher. Circuit rider, so, I saw it. Yeah, church family. And so I guess uh, I would say I was from uh, the Thibodeau area right. and then moved to New Orleans very briefly in uh, fifth or sixth grade and then right back to Terrebonne Parish through the end of high school. Huh. Uh, well, were you, uh, as, as a youngster growing up, uh, down in Terrebonne, uh, 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 drawn to the to music uh, in some fashion, form or fashion. I think. I mean, through the church, we were definitely. I mean, we grew up hearing. My, my father's a very good tenor. My mother was a very good alto, and so and my sister is a soprano. So when we sat in the congregation, we had four parts going on the whole time. Um, yeah. And so I do remember. I, it was definitely mm, uh, not the church that that a lot of kids grew up around here in New Orleans. It was like Methodist, Protestant, um, a little more straight laced as far as the music goes. Uh, so we had, so we had exposure right. to it and we loved it. Although like in Terrebonne Parish, there ain't a whole, at, 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 when I was growing up in Terrebonne Parish, the music programs were not, you know, they weren't outstanding. Uh, they weren't sending kids to NOCA. Where, uh, the uh, the church uh, music that you heard was kind of the traditional Methodist uh, repertoire. Out Methodist. of the hymnal, the choir might do something a little more advanced. It probably, yeah, they probably would do something slightly more advanced, but really typical um, Protestant hymns. Which uh -huh. I, I have to say, there's beautiful music in there. I'm sure you know. Right. Um, there's beautiful, beautiful music, and the har the harmonies are surprisingly interesting on some of these hymns. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a, a lot of uh, you feel a lot of the of folk music out of uh, the areas where the uh, composers of those hymns absolutely came absolutely. from. Absolutely, even Scandinavian song. composers, whatever folk music there was. Right. Is that WC had a great comment about uh, uh, box music? He said, "If you want to hear um, the folk music of Germany of the 17th century, listen to Bach." There it is. There it is. I'm glad to hear a comment like that. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, what uh, what got you uh, singing some? Did you play? Uh, were you drawn to uh, the keyboards at all in those days? Yeah, you know, I, I had a really good, you know, I say he was good. I was six years old, so I don't really know if he was good, but he was the organ and he was the organist at the church. And mm -hmm. so he started me reading music. Um, and I think at that age, really what he was doing was, you know, was opening my ears yeah. and uh, opening my heart to music. And so I did have a keyboard start, but I'm telling you, man, from about seventh grade on, there was just nothing, um, nothing structured. So I, I did learn a couple of journey songs in high school. The, you know, the ladies really appreciated, uh, the three journey songs that I knew, but other than that, that's <laughs> as far as I got. Yeah. Did you play those with some of your uh, colleagues? Or did you have a garage? Oh, band? we did. We did. Absolutely. You're so, I almost forgot. Absolutely. Uh, we had a band called Peace of Mind, and we covered that Boston song, and we might have covered a couple of Beatles songs. And, boy, I don't know what else we did. <laughs> but I ended up in New Orleans. The, uh, the guitarist and, and lead singer ended up being Emerald Lagasse Samoyer for a long time. So. There was some talent in that band. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what, what were your uh, interests as a youngster? If you, if you, if what music was it dominated? No, it wasn't like, music. What kind of things? Wow. <clears throat> okay, Fred, here we go. Break dancing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking 1985, 86, you know? Yeah. Um, skateboarding. I, I was actually kind of handy with a bow and arrow. I was pretty handy with firearms. Um, that was definitely part of my upbringing, including like being able to take them apart and put them back together 
with a stopwatch to make sure I could do it in under a minute. My stepfather was a little, a little extreme when it came to that, but um, that was all part of my upbringing, dragging a P-Rogue through the swamp. Um, so outdoor life and, and very and much, you a bit. Yeah. Very much outdoor life. Yeah. Uh, sadly, a lot of that territory is disappearing fast, man. You're telling me. I, I did my, my state science fair, which was award-winning state science fair project. It was about saltwater intrusion. And, um, yeah, as funny as it is to see that land disappear, the guys down there who love the land still vote for people who just allow it to be torn to sh shreds. I know. Shreds. <laughs> and until that changes, it continues, right? So trouble on that front, but we, we'll move on here in our story. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, what about uh, uh, piano lessons, anything like that? Did you ever get sure. a Sure, sure. I had piano lessons. Miss Louise, I think everybody probably had a Miss Louise. Yeah. And so I had some very rudimentary piano lessons um, just for a brief moment. Yeah, I think that was like sixth or seventh grade before, because when you live down the bayou, once you're seventh or eighth grade, you're taking your life into your own hands when you tell people you take piano lessons. <laughs> this wasn't could be cool. worse. Could be violin, I guess. But yeah, <laughs> it wasn't cool enough, so I, I didn't, I didn't continue the studies. Uh, yeah, I know, I know the feeling. Uh, what about maybe a guitar or something that would have been a little hipper? Did you try? Yeah, anything? we. I dabbled with guitar. It just dabbled, though. I got. I used to say I play guitar, but then you start working with some of the guys. <laughs> yeah. You work with Todd Duke, and it's like, oh, yeah, I don't play guitar. It's like I say about golf. Yeah, I own a set of clubs. Uh, <laughs> that's good to, to know. I own a set also, Fred. <laughs> you want to go on that walk anytime, we should do yeah, that. <laughs> Leave them in the bag, man. <laughs> Just take the walk. Uh, so uh, you come to New Orleans, uh, I know, and you auditioned multiple times for uh, the. Uh, you know, jazz studies program. Get me to that point in, in your musical development from man. From, it's uh, so this. it's it's so strange to me. I um I really have no idea how I ever thought to go audition. I mean, I guess people down in Terrebonne thought I was talented because I could, you know, get through open arms on, on the piano or some other journey power ballad. And I'd heard a little bit of Harry Connick Jr. He had just come out with uh, his earliest records, 20, 20 and yeah. something else. Right. And I thought, well, man, maybe if I practice really hard five or six years, I can be, you know, good like Harry Connick. I had no idea. Um, and, and gosh, it's, it's, it's very puzzling to me how I ever got the nerve to sit down in front of Ellis and those and Harold Batiste and Victor Goins and, and, play the piano and i use that word loosely and i think they were they, they were kind of surprised also <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they you didn't get in the first couple of times yeah i did not get in the first couple of times i you know what i'm i'm telling these stories and i'm remembering things now i i was at tulane university on a a wonderful scholarship and was continue, I, I was continually drawn to music. One day, uh, Ellis, Nick Payton, Chris Thomas, Brian Blade, and Victor Goins did a concert. And I went, and I had no idea. I just had no idea what was going on. But I decided, oh, man, maybe I could just take some piano lessons. I had electives I needed to fill. So I did take a year at, at Tulane. Um, and then after about a year, I started asking questions about jazz. And they were like, no, nah, no, nah, we don't do that at Tulane. And so I had to look for other options. And um, this was the time when Ellis had just recently returned. And so there was a lot of publicity about that school. Um, I met a young trumpet player named Antoine Dry. We both had a, uh, a part-time job down in the French Quarter. And he's, he, we, we, he walked me into Tower Records and bought me Thelonious Monk, the composer, and Duke Ellington, Blues in Orbit. And blew my yeah. mind. So that's actually how directly I got I decided I'd go audition for Mr. Marcellus. So uh, exposed to jazz on a very high level uh, at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I had two CDs. 
<laughs> and the experience of hearing those guys at the Tulane. Which... Oh, absolutely. But I got to say, I, I was, I, I, you know, I, I've seen the look on, on people's faces who do not understand what's going on or are unfamiliar with the repertoire. And I, I remember that feeling at 20 or 19 years old, like, what is going on? Why do I don't know any of these songs? What am I hanging on to here? Um, and, and even the energy uh, sort of was puzzling to me. I really didn't get it. Um, I really didn't get it. Yeah. What, what was your scholarship uh, to Tulane? What were you studying? I was studying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I test well. And so coming from Terrebonne Parish, when you have high test scores, they figure, okay, something's going on with this kid. And so I bounced around. My first major was politi polit political economy. And on the very first day of class, somebody made a William Harding joke and everyone laughed. And I was like, oh, I'm in deep trouble. I, <laughs> I don't get it. So I went to communications and I went philosophy and I went to English. And then I went to uh, drop out. Ladies and gentlemen. About two Lord years in. I'm a Renaissance like, man. That's right. <laughs> uh, well, I wanted to back up too. In high school, was mostly just pop music you were listening to, other than the music you heard in church. It was hip hop. It was Public Enemy. Right. It was it was really public. I mean, and I love the Beatles. I was really into the Beatles. Um, but but my friends and I would listen to Public Enemy, Eric B. and Rakim, LL Cool J, Run DMC, and uh, really scare the hell out of our parents. I remember when Run DMC uh, made an appearance at uh, Jazz Fest. This was pretty early in the hip hop era. Well, that's probably when hip hop was like really hip hop. I mean, you go back and you listen to the lyrics that Chuck D was, what he was writing. And uh, I, I, yeah, I think, I think the genre has lost something. I'm sure there are other guys out there now. I'm an old bitter man, but yeah. give me Chuck D, 1989. Yeah, there you go, Daddy. Uh, so you... Uh, you're getting a sense of jazz and uh, you're starting to meet or at least hear some people here. Uh, how many, uh, how did you, uh, how, what was the third time you auditioned that you? Uh, the third time. I think they were just like, look, we better let him in. He's coming back every semester. <laughs> so they did let me in. They immediately assigned me to, uh, it's definitely not a, I, I was assigned to basically a private, uh, to, to a classical teacher for technique. Right. Um, because I couldn't, I was in college. Two years in, I couldn't play my major scales. <laughs> I mean, this is like, I, I, I think about it. Why, I don't know why they let me in. I, I can't figure it out. They, uh, anyway, they, so I ended up being in a, a very, I mean, studying with an intern, uh, interim teacher who taught me to play scales in two hands. And... I did that for a year before I actually got into the studio of Ellis. During this time, I was actually, I was listed as, as one of his students, but I was so nervous, just terrified to meet him. So I would just stay away. <laughs> Literally for a year, when we finally met, he said, man, you've been a shadow to me. I have no idea who you are. I have no, I've never heard you play. I don't know where you come from. I was hiding. Well, uh, you begin to emerge, though, after uh, you got some fundamentals under your thumbs and fingers. <laughs> and look at what happens, man. You practice your scales, boys and girls. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's no getting there without that, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, None you got to get it. <laughs> you got to get it. I, I will say I can remember, I remember sitting in the church, uh, you know, at a very young age and realizing that I could... I could sing other melodies to the hymns. Uh -huh. Sometimes they'd be borrowed melodies from another hymn, or sometimes they'd be a pop song, but I, I could hear the way chords moved, and I was able to impose melodies on those chord moves, you know, on those chord movements at a young age. So at some point, that started to translate to a performance level. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was a, a, an, inclin or a, an, an innate ability to uh, sort of understand the architecture of what you were. Yeah, yeah, well said. Well said. Um, well, after year one, you finally showed up on Mr. Marcellus's radar. Yeah. Did you begin to uh, work more closely with him then? I did. I did. Um, it, it took, man, I really had issues with performance anxiety and just anxiety in general. Um, and so 
I, it took, it took me a long time. Um, I, I had finished two years at Tulane and then I took a year where I was at UNO where I was not studying with him. And then I had about a year before I, or maybe two years before I was actually got an undergraduate degree. And so most of that time I would go to his office. He would set up a CD player. And at that time, CD players had just come out with the loop where you could loop section A to B. And, and he set me up on a 10 second loop. And then he'd leave and he'd say, listen to this and try to learn, figure out what this guy's playing. Um, or we would talk about how he grew up and the, the players that he was listening to. He was very keen on Horace Silver. And so I would listen to a lot of Horace Silver. Um, and so after I got my undergraduate degree, he offered me a graduate assistantship. And at that point, our relationship sort of, you know, it got into a deeper level. Right. And, and definitely more, he, he had higher expectations at that point of both me as a student and, and as his assistant. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you did that for how long? I did that for two years. Yeah. And so we did a lot of, um, you know, and it's a lot of it, a lot of it was not it's piano. A lot of it was not piano lessons. A lot of it was, uh, here's 17 big band scores. I need you to put them in finale for me or, you know, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we need the big band room set up and all the music laid out. Right. Uh, he assigned me to all the vocalists, all the vocal students um, as their accompanist, um, which worked out really well because then eventually, I mean, he knew what he was doing. And eventually I'm, I'm, I'm accompanying Trisha Boutte, John Boutte, uh, Jermaine Basil and George French. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that was probably a really good idea. Right. He had such a, a, a gift for sort of un, uh, uh, discerning how a student learned and then how he, uh, what kind of lessons he could put in front of them or questions he absolutely. Could put them that would take advantage of that ability. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He didn't mince words. I mean, I, 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 was, I was fortunate to, he, I, I remember playing a transcription of, of a piece he played, uh, Spring Can Really Hang You Up the Most, on his Heart of Gold record. And I played it for him one day and he sat there quietly and then he said, you have the tools, man, you have the tools to do this. I, I, I didn't know what he meant by do this. I mean, I was like kind of excited, but I've also heard him tell people, Hey man, is there something else you do? That's right. You yeah. know, is there a, I hope you have a, other things in your life that you, you can do. He will not mince words because he really, I think he looked at the music as a very unforgiving business. And if, you're really not into it or you really don't have it. He was not going to push you into it. Yeah. He, he had lived that uh, experience uh, himself. So, so deeply. He told me once he was a great quote about is why they decided to get into teaching and go back and get his master's at Loyola was he said, my wife, Dolores could balance a budget on a quarter a month, but that quarter had to be there every month. Yes. Yes. Well said. Yeah, well, and uh, you know, some some that whole experience up uh, about how he how he had struggled to, but hang, he was able to hang on to his aesthetic and his artistry throughout that long career. He sure was. He sure yeah. was. In 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 ways that uh, certainly benefited me as a listener and just someone who got to know him. You know, absolutely. I'm with you. And, all, and many of us in this in this in who fell under that. his. Uh, uh, in in a way, even though he wasn't, I was never a, a student of his. I've learned a lot from the man. Absolutely, I would, I'd call you a student for sure. Yeah. Uh, so you're 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 progressing as a pianist. You're getting to the point. Are you starting to play some uh, then while you're in, uh, around town? I thought I was because at UNO, part of the thing was uh, making you believe that that this UNO experience was going to somehow like continue to grow and your career was going to continue to blossom. So I was in the UNO at some point I got into their, uh, into the, the traveling band. Um, and so we would travel to Europe and sort of pitch the school as well as the music. Right. But this was, uh, the effort led by Harold Baptiste and the guys in the band. I mean, Derek Doge was the saxophone player. And so a very, very young Derek Doge was still very good. Yeah. I mean, at 19, that kid was, he was playing, he was playing. Right. So, uh, we, I ended up in that traveling band and we kind of, uh, I think we traveled for two summers and then we graduated 
in and around. I think I was graduating my master's program at the same time the other guys were graduating undergrad. And so we tried to keep the band together. But as soon as we got out of college, of course, without the college backing, suddenly your career is just, <laughs> there's just nothing. They pull the rug out from underneath and you're like, wait, we were, last year we were so popular. We had Jazz Fest. We had interviews. We had private parties. Now we have nothing. Right. Welcome to the real world. There it is. And all the words that Ellis uh, had spoken for the last, then you're like, oh, this is what he meant. Ah. <laughs> This is why I better have some real passion for this thing here and some ability too. Absolutely. Yeah. Right at the end of my term, um, the Meridian Hotel had decided to add a piano player. And so they called the school looking for somebody to do the gig. And being the graduate assistant, I was, you know, they gave me the job. And so for, gosh, probably three to four years after I got out of college, I'd play the five to seven set at the Murray. This was like, this was, this was four or five nights a week. I'd play the five to seven. I didn't have two hours off where I'd eat in the employee cafeteria. And then I'd go back and play nine to 12. Wow. And so that was it for me for three or four years. Mike Polera was at the Windsor court. He'd tell me, dude, you're really young to be doing this gig. Of course he should know having sat at that polo lounge for so long. He's like, don't you want to join a band, get in the van and tour the country? Uh -huh. And I, I just stayed in that lobby for, I was, that was, I don't know, that was a path to a paycheck. That was really, I was a little bit older than the 18 and 19 year olds who, you know, right. who were cutting their teeth. I was in my mid twenties. And so I needed to pay rent. Well, I, I think the di in developing the discipline of doing what you need to do to survive. Plus, uh, you know, uh, playing as often as you can. You're right. Really, uh, came paid off for you. I, I know it did. I know it did. I didn't know it did. I learned a pile of songs and Ellis would still come to the hotel lobby occasionally and I'd tighten up. I can remember my shoulders just tightening <laughs> up. I, I, <laughs> uh, Torganowski early on came by and, uh, he had a $5 bill and he put it in the jar and called Satin Doll. Now at the time I was trying to be a bebopper. So Satin Doll, I was like, you know, okay, if you need me to play Satin Doll, but I really didn't know the bridge very well. And he came back up to the tip jar and he took the money and he said, and you owe me some change and walked out. <laughs> Another lesson. And, and boy, did I learn satin doll that night. Yeah. <laughs> and he probably never, uh, never dropped it since. <laughs> no, you let me know what you want, what key, what tempo, what style. I've got you covered. I got you. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you're getting your education continue beyond graduate school. Go, go on to a PhD level here. Right? <laughs> it does as, as it, you know, you keep an open mind and New Orleans is fertile ground. As you know, I don't have to say it. Right. I don't have to say it. New Orleans is fertile ground. You can learn was, here. Was that the room where uh, Jacques Gautier used to play it all the sure time? It sure is. It sure was. On yeah. the weekends, they'd have Jacques and they'd have uh, Marva Wright. Oh, yeah, right. And then once a month, they would have the Paul Longstreth Trio. That was like the little bone that they would throw me. And so, and this, I, I got, you know, Tor Torganowski was, uh, you know, was vital in my upbringing. And most of the time, it was just because of things he would tell me to do. Um, rather than hire your friends on this gig, give all the money to Don Sewer and have him come in and play the duo, just accompany Don Sewer give all the money to Harold Baptiste and have him come in and play saxophone. Uh, uh, hire Gerald Adams uh, on, on bass and get, you know, so he, you know, he was really, these lessons, uh, I don't underestimate the value of those lessons. Plus you got the benefit of, of those guys' vast experience. I mean, Don Sewer, any song, any song, Every song. It was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah, on, on sax and clarinet. I mean, he was... Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and speaking of, like, how to just how to make ends meet, he'd come in with the, the saxophone with rubber bands and dollar bills stuck in the pads, and I don't know how he got sound out of that, but <laughs> like no other, Don Seward. Yeah, he's one of the great, uh, uh, still un, too unheralded New Orleans jazz artists. You're right about that. You're right about that. Great, great player. So you, man, you, you just had, uh, 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 you know, once you got into the milieu, you started really meeting wonderful people. 
Yeah, I guess I, you know, that gig is probably more important than I realized because I was getting the hotel money that I could then give to cats. Like, please come play my gig. Yeah. And there were times that it wouldn't work. I'd call Shannon Powell and he wouldn't show up. And Torkinowski would say, well, the, pro the, thing, the thing about Shannon is you got to have another drummer in your back pocket. <laughs> so get one of these students that you would know who you can call at the last second and say, get down here right away. Um, but yeah, I did, you know, I did listen to Tork. At some point, Tork started to, uh, you know, he's, he's triple booked, you know, always. He always has three gigs. Right. And so one, the most important lesson he told me early on was when I call, pick up the phone and say yes. <laughs> and so I did. And for, for David Torganowski and Devel Crawford, I was like the last minute call. And it would often be, yeah. I need you to be there in one hour in a tuxedo with a keyboard. And, and I'm off. That's that, okay. I'm there. So you, you, uh, moved into a, a really, um, you know, uh, interesting place because that puts you in, you had to be ready across a wide range of things. Oh, absolutely. And can you imagine the look on their faces when they hire David Torganowski and he doesn't show up and he sends some kid who just graduated from UNO. Johnny Adams was not happy. Uh -huh. Johnny Adams was not happy when he met me. That was not a good news for him. It was like, uh, I mean, it was, it, there, there was no ego involved. It was all just, oh gosh, please just don't kill me. Just, just don't kill me. <laughs> uh, definitely, uh, they threw me to the fire. Yeah. Well, that also got you out of the, the solo thing and, in, and playing in groups. It did. And uh, boy, you have uh, picked up a lot of great partners through the years there. Amazing. The, you have the, a nice first being, the first being Bob French, by the way. The, uh, you know, Torque. Tork would definitely had a big part in the Bob French experience. And so he started calling me to sub Bob's gigs. And at some point, Bob called me and was like, you ready for a real gig? Cause he, I don't know what he thought about my hotel gig, but apparently it wasn't real. So then, um, he hired me at the time Storyville on Bourbon street had bands every night. All right. A couple of bands a night and catering for the bands, by the way. And, uh, so I started working with Bob six nights a week. I think we did, I, we did one of the sets. I don't know. It was either a five o'clock set or an eight o'clock set. And we did that with uh, Irvin Charles on the bass. Oh, nice. You want to learn Fats Domino tunes? Hey. Irvin Charles on the bass. We'll teach them to you. Yeah. And of course, our front line was uh, Kid Chocolate and Steve Slim Walker on, sa on a trombone and the one and only Trisha Boutte on vocals. So that's how you met or got working with anyway, Trisha. That is exactly how we met. And that turned into a long running relationship. Always, man. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But yeah, we've been uh, partners in crime, as she likes to say, partners in crime for, you know, the better part of 25 years. She's in Massachusetts or? Oh, she's in Norway. Norway now. Huh? She's in Norway. Yeah. Okay. I, I, Wow. Yeah. <laughs> way, way. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know, those European bands, it's not uncommon. The European bands at the time were coming. I mean, I'm sure they still are, but I'm talking about we were doing gigs at uh, Joe's Cozy Corner. All right. Sunday afternoons in our Sunday best. I mean, coming in in church clothes. And there would be European bands that would come looking for a front person. And, and one of these Norwegian bands came and listened to uh, Kermit's band, but Trisha was singing. Uh, and uh, and they hired her, and she started working in Norway regularly. When Katrina happened, the prime minister offered her a green card, and she's n never come home. Never, never come home. She, <laughs> but you know, there is that. Uh, there is a pretty established, long established connection between New Orleans and Scandinavia, uh, yeah. writ large, uh, and with having to do with trad jazz. Sure. They, you're absolutely right. Big fans, big fans. And they, they also have a very interesting brass band tradition there, uh, a community brass band. And the, the, the old bands don't swing, but man, those guys are, you know, they could play the, uh, now they probably do swing, but when, you right. know, back in the day, they had a, a tradition of uh, just the, the brass band. The virtuosic uh, 
sure. communities. Sure. Well, and just, commu- you know, they still have community bands, community choirs. The music is still a big part of the culture on an amateur level as well. Yeah. Now, you also work with uh, John Boutte. Yes. Yes. How did, how did that, uh, when, when did that start? Man, I, you know, the gig I remember the most was uh, a job we did in Brazil in uh, mid to late August 2005. Oh, is that where you yeah. were when the thing that happened? That is where we were. That is where we were. And um, I had just gotten into the band. I mean, I'd played with them before because I worked with all the Boutes and I'd hung out with all the Boutes. So we, we knew each other pretty well by that point. But um, I had just gotten into that band and we were there watching the news reports. And when we had to leave, they basically said, you can fly anywhere in the country you want except New Orleans. <laughs> oh, wow. And so unfortunately, my time with John was really short and we've worked together a number of times since, but not, not in any kind of official capacity. So it was unfortunately kind of brief with John. Where, where did you, uh, what flight did you take? Where'd you go? I, I went to Houston. My father had, uh, my father and his wife who have lived in New Orleans all their lives, up and left Mardi Gras day, 2005. They I, like, obviously were just tired of it or something because they pulled out Mardi Gras day, 2005, moved to Houston and, um, so I had I had a nice soft landing when I when I got back. Did you stay there uh, for I, some period? Or? I did. It. Kermit Kermit ended up moving there, and he and I got as as close as you can get to Kermit. You know, he's a little bit of a loose cannon, but uh, he, we were kind of tight. And he would pick me up and before the gigs, and oh, we're just gonna pull in right here for a quick one, and we'd have a drink and. I ended up being like he had, when he when his daughter Caitlin was born, he asked me to be the the parent. So Caitlin Orleans is a, one of my one of my godchildren. Very so cool. Kermit and I had a nice relationship, and that band was great. Mark Brooks on bass. Um, it was another hot band. And uh, at some point, Kermit decided to come back to New Orleans. And as soon as he did, all the New Orleans gigs that were in Houston dried up. He was really the, the driving force behind all of that. I had that. Did you uh, split from Houston pretty quick after that? Then? I eventually, I mean, I tried, I tried some other locations. What I didn't realize, Fred, was like what we did, what we do in New Orleans, it doesn't happen anywhere else. No. I, I moved to the panhandle of Florida. Uh, there was a great guitar player out there, a great singer named Jimmy Ward. And I got out there and I thought all my gigs, I thought all of this was going to translate into these other areas. Well, it didn't work in a panhandle of Florida, surprise. So I went to Nashville and didn't really work for me in Nashville. So I was driving. I, I tried to line up gigs. I would drive Nashville, Memphis, New Orleans, Houston, San Antonio. And that was my little loop. And I had gigs in all those places. Um, but it did. <laughs> what we do just doesn't happen anywhere else. So about 2009, I came home. It's kind of like trying to get French bread somewhere else. Maybe. Uh, I wish somebody would have told me that. <laughs> you can't do it, man. <laughs> so, uh, well, I think I may have heard you more with Leroy Jones than anyone else. Uh, Thank goodness. Talk about, talk about that, man. And you've well, got you know, I've done, I had worked with, I had worked with Kermit at this point. I'd worked a lot with Bob and George French. And uh, but, uh, I'm, I was working with Bob at Donna's every Monday night. And of course, Leroy Jones was there as well. Um, he was using a great piano player na- named Glenn Pasha, and Glenn oh, had to yeah. go. Yeah. And I was right there. I was sitting at the piano that night. So actually, sometime later, he really said, uh, he told me that I, re- I reminded him of Ed Frank. Oh, that's I, He actually nice said, I, I, you know, I hired you because you reminded me of Ed Frank, which... I mean, that blew my mind. But anyway. Probably the best one-handed piano player that I've ever heard. Well, that's what Torganowski said, too. He said, that's because you got no left hand. <laughs> A typical Torganowski. It's player. always Torganowski, man. <laughs> yeah, so, so that relationship, that, that definitely took it to a, di- a different level. Leroy was signed with Columbia at the time. And so we were, I was immediately thrown onto, like, world tours basically um and making 
you know, making solid bread and playing big festivals and, uh, and playing with Leroy Jones, which <laughs> the man doesn't, he's not off. He doesn't have off nights. One thing you re- realize when you work with Leroy is every night is an on night. Yeah. Um, and so that band, Gerald French on drums and either Mitchell Player or Kerry Lewis on bass and Craig Klein on trombone. Boy. And it was hot. It was hot. I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, we're the new jazz messengers. I mean, we were really tearing it up. Really yeah, tearing Leroy, it up. Leroy is uh, Dan Morgenstern's favorite trumpet player in the world. Oh, right on. And for good reason. Yeah. Right, so, Dan. So uh, you endorses his good taste yes yeah absolutely absolutely um well uh, all of that has uh added to a, um, a a splendid experience you've had with with music what what are you been up to now are you able to uh do anything or what would you uh, be doing so I, I, I was really my, my wife uh teaches early child in the early child i think they call it early childhood development at saint george's episcopal Oh, yeah. um, really interesting approach to education for very young people. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess in 2017, the person who was charged with teaching music to very young people left the job. And so I, I said, I'll, I'll do it until the school year is over. And just like New Orleans, I haven't ever left. Yeah. So a lot of my work this in this quarantine situation has been f- making videos for these students. Oh, that's nice. And it's a, well, one way to derive a small, small portion of the, of, of income, but that's kind of where my, uh, this year has gone just trying to figure out how to connect with these kids that you don't get to see anymore and, uh, how to get them to love music and feel music when they have to look at a computer screen instead of me. Right. So that's been, a. Uh, other than that, I kind of have been, you know, I still keep the hotel gig going because it pays so well. I still work with Leroy Jones. He has a preservation hall. And the, I work with the Preservation Hall Foundation Band, which is also sort of their educational offshoot. Um, so all these gigs keep me busy enough, busy enough. I occasionally get to go to Snug Harbor when somebody hires me and get a good introduction by Fred Caston. <laughs> No extra charge for that, Daddy. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. The uh, well, you know, great thing about teaching, and, and I think it maybe even particularly sh- so when you're doing it for very young people, uh, is uh, you really got to get get together in your head what it is you're talking about. That's the truth. You got to know what you, you you have to have an idea in order to explain an idea. You better know the idea, and then be able to put it in easily accessible terms for for youngsters. I mean, if they would let these toddlers into clubs, my gigs would be packed. <laughs> They'd be packed. They're at the gates. Mr. Paul, Mr. <laughs> Paul. I said, why you can't get into the gigs though? They'd all be holding up their uh, bottles of formula. Absolutely. <laughs> we got juice. <laughs> and so I, <laughs> well, maybe we can, uh, after, after the, uh, after the uh, pandemic, uh, maybe we can start that club for toddlers. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> They're going to need something to do after being right. kept inside for all these months. Well, Paula, we are uh, cl- clocking down the last uh, 60 seconds of, of our allotted time here or so. So I'm just going to say thanks again, man, for, for doing it. It was really a wonderful conversation. Man, I love it. I was so honored that you called for real. I really, really appreciate it.